Hey guys, this is David Wonderlich for GatorCountry.com, and I am going to talk about one of the most frustrating losses I've ever seen from this Florida program, and that was last Saturday night against LSU. So many things went right, and just a few things went so terribly wrong that they managed to lose a game they had no business losing. Now, with this video, I'm going to talk a little more about bigger picture strategy stuff instead of nitty-gritty details, and I'm going to start by talking about running the ball. Now, this was a terrible issue last year. It's been almost as big of an issue this year, and in fact, after the Tennessee game, Dan Mullen told everybody that he didn't even really try to get a running game going against the Volunteers. Now, I watched the game pretty closely, saw the play-by-play. -play. They tried for a quarter, but that was about it, and then... I don't think this was some kind of 40 chess, I know that you know that, I know that you know, but LSU did not always focus on stopping the run, and that did actually play into the Gators' favor at times. And here, I'm going to show you an example uh, in a moment, because outside of the red zone, Florida had success rate with the run of almost 58%, just a shade under, and that is a fantastic number. Success rate is a measure of, are you staying on schedule, as coaches like to say, and 42% is about average for everybody. Just throw all the teams together. If you're above 50%, you're doing great. And with the pass outside the red zone, they were right about 52%. So run or pass outside the red zone, for the most part, except for a couple of really catastrophic plays, they were doing great. And they could have run the ball more if they wanted to because they're having success. And let's take a look at one of these uh, success plays. The Gators offense at the beginning of the second quarter. This is the second play of the second quarter, second down and nine. And as you can see, LSU only has five guys in the box. And um, this linebacker is not blitzing. He's going to drop. So LSU is only rushing four. They're dropping seven. This is something they did pretty consistently throughout the night. Not all the time, but um, Florida is going to get a pretty big run here off of the halfback draw, one of Steve Spurrier's most favorite plays. So you can see Trask stands up first, like he's going to be dropping back. And this is just to give a little bit of delay. And if you look, uh, the safety is looking that way. This guy's looking that way. This guy's looking that way. Uh, almost nobody is actually looking at the quarterback except for this linebacker right here. And he's not going to be uh, a problem because Stuart Reese gets a good block on him. And now Malik Davis has enormous room to run. And you can see he's only just now noticing. He still doesn't notice. He's like, uh-oh. So there goes Malik Davis for a big rushing gain. That is uh, an example of how Florida was able to catch LSU napping and get a nice big run. So we're going to scroll up ahead and see what LSU does on the very next play. Now LSU has six in the box. And Florida has the same exact box lineup here. Five offensive linemen, quarterback, running back. In the core of the formation, it's the same as last time, but now LSU is putting an additional person against the run. And they're actually going to blitz both linebackers this time, uh, get a shot in on Trask. So LSU adjusted immediately to giving up that big run play. And that is an example of why you want to be able to have uh, a rushing attack. It forces the defense to do things differently. Now, this obviously didn't work out so good um, because, you know, the pass goes skittering down the, the, the field there as uh, Trask is hit while throwing. Um, but... You did have one-on-one -on -one coverage, and if Trask was actually able to get this play, uh, the throw off, he could have dropped it in over the top to Xavier Henderson out there. So again, this is why you want to be able to have at least some amount of running game. One thing Florida does not have much of is a quarterback running game, because Kyle Trask is a pocket passer, and he's a very good one at that. So this is later on in that same drive, and this is the pick six. It still doesn't make any sense to me, but if we watch this go forward a little bit, you can see LSU is only sending four, they're dropping seven, and they are completely selling out on pass coverage, except for those four rushers. Now, Kyle Trask is looking over this way. Um, that's where he goes with the ball. It's a four on three over there. There's four defenders against uh, three receivers. So I have no idea why he decided to throw over that way. If Kyle Trask was a more mobile quarterback, he can just go right up here and get the six yards he needs for the first down. But he's not. He forces the throw, it goes the other way, and it's a touchdown. So if Florida had something of a quarterback run game other than just designated called rushes, um, they could have avoided some bad situations. Now, as I said, red zone was a problem, as you knew if you watched the game. Um, 
here, Kyle Trask at second and goal. Uh, Florida's down 14-7. This is midway through the second quarter. Kyle Trask is looking around, looking around, trying to find somebody to throw to. Uh, the offensive line can only keep its blocks going for so long, and he's going to force a throw into the back of the end zone, trying to hit Keon Zipper, and he throws it a little high. But again, if Kyle Trask was more of a runner, he's got a lane here that he can uh, go scrambling up the middle. But instead, uh, he's just going to try to force a pass, and it ends up going incomplete. And, you know, that's another way that Florida left some points on the field. This is the very next play. It is third down. And as you can see here, uh, Florida is using its alternate offensive line lineup. Um, they finally decided to uh, sit Gene DeLance down and see what uh, a different lineup would look like. So we've got Garage at left tackle, Stone Forsyth slides over to right, and Ethan White, who's finally healthy, is over in at left guard. So um, LSU did some things uh, to try to attack this line because uh, whatever you think of the quality of the players, they just haven't played together that all that much. And so on this play, uh, Florida's in empty, which they did a lot, and LSU is showing six guys who could possibly be coming, six guys in the box. And if you're going to blitz six against five, this is not a bad area of the field to do it because uh, there's just not a lot of room for guys to get open quickly. So uh, before this frame, Kyle Trask uh, pointed out uh, that this guy looks like he's going to come, and he doesn't. He drops back. Um, so Ethan White uh, took a step over this way as though he needed to block this guy, which he was showing he was coming, uh, but he's not coming. This guy's coming, and so you end up with three offensive linemen blocking only two Tigers, one-on-one -on -one here, one-on-one -on -one here, and there's no one left to get the actual blitzing linebacker, and Kyle Track just has to chuck it out the back of the end zone. Now here we are, uh, end of the first half, second quarter, 33 seconds to go. Um, this is the original lineup, right? You got Delance is still in the game, or just back in the game, I should say. But uh, LSU is still going to do its favorite thing to confuse the L Florida offensive line, which is uh, doing stunts. So you're going to have one guy come forward, another guy go around him, one guy goes forward, another guy goes around him. And on this play and the next one, basically whichever side Brett Heggie helps on is the safe side, and whichever side he doesn't help is the danger side. So Heggie's going to go to his right this time, and uh, he's going to pick up a block here, but Garage and Forsyth on the other side uh, don't handle this twist very well, and the guy coming around is going to get a free lane at Kyle Trask. And so there he goes. Now Trask is able to complete a throw because he rolled out, which is good, but... Um, that is foreboding because on the very next play, they're going to do it again. And this time, Heggie helps out on the left, which makes sense because they didn't handle the, the uh, stunt very well that time. Which means the right side is now going to be the problem. He's actually splitting Reese and Delance, which is not good. Because that means neither one of them has any chance in the world at getting the stunting guy who's going to come around. And Kyle Trask doesn't react quickly enough and he ends up fumbling it and LSU gets a free three points after that. So going after Florida's offensive line, regardless of lineup with stunts, is uh, one of the primary ways LSU tried to get uh, pressure in key situations. Florida did try to make some adjustments, and here is one of them. They actually do get Kyle Trask involved in the rushing game. So if you watch, Florida sends Malik Davis to the other side. We get a little bit of a shift. We get uh, the seven guys in the box here thinking, okay, we're going to hand off the ball here. And it is seven on seven over here in the middle. And that is only favorable uh, for a running attack if the quarterback is going to be a runner. And this time he is. So if you watch, here we go. LSU is entirely selling out on the run, which makes it a perfect time for Kyle Trask to surprise the defense on a keeper. Now, he only gets six yards out of this, but that is a good way to show that, uh, hey, you've got to watch out for the quarterback now. And if we go two plays later, so we're going to fast forward past this. Good completion to Copeland. Uh, we now have another rushing situation. And Florida has a tight end to block this time. And it is uh, seven on six here because you have four down linemen. You have two linebackers. And so even though Kyle Trask is not going to keep it on this, you have six blockers and a running back makes seven. So it's seven on six. And Malik Davis is able to get around the end and get a good six yards. So, uh, 
again, if you can get six yards on first down, uh, that is a good thing. You take it. And LSU was giving it up on that play. And so we'll uh, fast forward a little more again. Good pass out to Malik Davis to uh, pick up some more yardage. And now we have... Uh, this is the same situation as Trask's surprise keeper. You've got four down linemen, three linebackers, seven in the box against seven Gators here. And so if, again, if this is going to be a good situation to run, uh, you need to have the quarterback be mobile. And in fact, if you watch this, the backside defensive end here is hanging back. He is respecting Kyle Trask's ability to run. So this is why you have Kyle Trask run that keeper, not just to get six yards, but also because you want to force the defense to make an adjustment. Now, they don't actually run it on this play because if you notice here, uh, as we're getting set up, this is defensive back number two. He's a freshman. Um, the announcers didn't even really know he was on the team at the beginning of the game, but they're down so many players. Uh, he is just lollygagging. And if you look, Trask is looking out this way. He is keeping an eye on that entirely. And he's going to make the heads up play to throw it out here where we've got, you know, blockers and it's four on three and you get Kadarius Tony a very easy touchdown because number two is not paying attention. Now, after Florida took the lead, they had three straight three and outs. And I really wanted to take a look and see just what happened with these plays. Did Florida suddenly get conservative or was it something else? So here's the first of these. You can see LSU has six in the box. Florida has six blockers plus a running back. So this is actually good numbers to run. And so Florida will run. Um, you can call running conservative, but as I showed you earlier, when Florida had the numbers, uh, they were having success with the run game. This was not a bad choice. And so Florida is going to pull two guys, Stuart Reese, Kamori Gamble. This is a kind of run scheme they do all the time. Dan Mullen's been doing it forever. Uh, and you're just going to miss blocks. So Gamble kind of gets turned around to the inside here. I'm not entirely sure what's going on with that, uh, but that causes him to miss the linebacker. Kadarius Tony coming out here is going to completely miss a block on the safety, and so a linebacker and a safety are, are hemming in the ball carrier. You've got the guy coming around from the backside, and so this run ends up going nowhere, not because it was a bad call, but because there was bad blocking. just didn't go anywhere. So now we skip ahead. Florida goes empty here, and let's see what happens on this play. So you get Kyle Trask rolling out, and there's just no one open. Um, the offensive line is not really holding blocks all that well. It's uh, You've got the end coming this way and end coming around from the backside. And LSU, again, dropping four, sorry, uh, rushing four, dropping seven, and not really open, not really open. He's not really open, not really open. There's just, there's just nobody open. And that happened occasionally. LSU, believe it or not, is actually at or near the top of the SEC in um, lowest completion percentage allowed. They don't allow a ton of completions. It's just when they do allow completions, um, they uh, tend to go really badly. So as Trask is rolling out here, we can't see him. Um, if he wanted to and was able to, he might have been able to get Kadarius Toney uh, coming in a little bit here, but instead he just throws it away. So now it is third and nine because we had... Uh, poor run blocking on first down and not great pass blocking and no one really open on second down. So does Florida get conservative? And the answer is no, it is third and nine and they are going to go for it. So uh, they've got single coverage outside. And so Kyle Trask just has to look at the safety. And this is just going to be a miscommunication between Kyle Trask and Jacob Copeland. Copeland is in one-on-one -on -one coverage out here. Trask thinks that Copeland is going to make a move to the sideline, and that's where the ball goes. Copeland, I think, sees the safety coming over, and I'm going to guess, and this is just a guess because I haven't talked to him, he's going to try to cut in underneath that safety. And so we get the ball just going wide. You've got Copeland made his interior cut. The ball is about to fall right about here. And so that's just execution. We have bad run blocking on first down, uh, no one getting open and not great pass blocking on second down, and then a miscommunication on third down. I don't think these were play call problems. This was just execution problems. Here comes the next three and out. Uh, here's first down, and rather than run the ball, uh, Florida is going to try a swing pass to Malik Davis, and Florida actually has good numbers out here, pretty good blocking. 
uh, Davis has room to go. The problem is he slips and falls down. I don't know if the fog was making the grass wet or what, but he tried to make a little bit of a cut, stumbled, and only gets three yards. So that's unfortunate. That's not great. He had definitely the ability to get more than just three yards, but that's all they get on first down. So that's unfortunate. Now comes on second down. And what do we see here? We've got five guys in the box against five offensive linemen and a running back. So uh, the is numbers to run and Florida will run. So we get a little bit of an adjustment here and Malik Davis is now trying to run. Uh, he ends up cutting back inside. I'm not entirely sure why, because that puts him directly into the backside defensive end who's unblocked. This looks like a better lane to go, but for whatever reason, he either doesn't see it or he's concerned about uh, the safety coming up. So he ends up cutting back directly into the defensive end. Now he does get four yards, which is certainly better than nothing. It sets up third and three. So not a terrible play, but I think it probably could have been better. So that's two straight plays that did not pick up first downs and probably could have been better. And let's see what happens on third down. So we drop back and Kyle Trask immediately is trying to hit Keon Zipperer on this uh, crossing route over the middle. Um, that appears to be a uh, very quick decision. I don't know if he made it before the snap, but if you look at his head, he first looks like he's looking at the safety. Then he moves his head over, looks at the other one, and they're both kind of staying back. So he thinks he's got room to make this throw. The problem is Keon Zipper doesn't get any separation whatsoever. And so the guy who's covering him, not from the back, but from the front, is able to uh, get in and break up the pass. Now, it's easier for me to be a Monday morning quarterback and say that looks like Jacob Copeland is the better choice over here because he actually does get some separation and, you know, the ball's already out of trash cans, so you don't know exactly what the defender is doing, but this is our friend number two, the freshman. Uh, if we watch this go forward, yep, there it is, number two. So I like Jacob Copeland's chances against that freshman. He's already had catches against that freshman. Um, I don't know what the play call was, so I don't know why uh, Florida didn't target him specifically, but that probably would have been better than trying to force one into zipper over the middle. So again, uh, you got just some unfortunate things with Malik Davis on first and second down, and then a questionable decision on the throw on third down. Here's the last of the three and outs. It starts on the Gators' own one yard line. So obviously the problem here must have been that Dan Mullen went way too conservative, right? Uh, well, no, no, it wasn't. Um, this first down, I'm not entirely sure what happens here, but Kyle Trask drops back to throw, and he's trying to hit... Uh, I believe that is Trevon Grimes at the sideline. It's really foggy. And he thinks he's getting single coverage out there. And so he takes a shot down the field. And I don't think Grimes ever saw the ball. Um, he did not even come close. The ball's coming out way back here somewhere. So bad throw or Grimes didn't see the ball. Uh, it was really foggy. So what are you going to do? So we tried to take a shot down the field on first down. That is not a conservative play. Now comes second down and you think, oh, well, here comes uh, Damian Pierce subbing into the game. They're probably going to go run because they just want to make sure they get some amount of yardage here on second down, right? Well, LSU's got six in the box this time, and Florida does play action. Uh, they are bringing up the defense, uh, freezing this linebacker right here with the play action, but they're still attacking down the field. This is not a conservative play call. And in fact, you're going to get Kadarius Toney coming wide open on the out route. And Kyle Trask just misses him high. You see Tony has to leap for the ball, can't quite catch it. And again, you wonder about visibility in the fog, but um, from this angle, you can't tell exactly whether Tony could see it or not. But uh, throws a little too high, a little too far out, and no good. So now it is third and ten. And you might think, all right, well, if we're going conservative, now we're just going to run the ball and try to get some amount of room for our punter. But instead... Florida goes four wide, and Kadarius Tony's in the backfield. He's not even really close to, to uh, Kyle Trask here. And, in fact, he's going to go out on a pass pattern. So they're effectively going empty. Technically not, because Tony's there. But uh, they're taking away the chances of running, unless Kyle Trask is going to do it himself. And uh, Trask here ends up rolling out of the pocket, and he ends up getting uh, Trevon Grimes behind the defense. Now, you can't see him. He's right about here, just five yards back, and he's behind the defense, waving his hand, saying, please throw me the ball. And so if we watch Kyle Trask now, 
come back to the end zone. He like throws the ball off his back foot while hopping. It's I have no idea why he decided to throw the ball like that. He's trying to get rid of the ball before rushers get to him, but he has time to set his feet and throw. And because he his base is not set and he throws it while hopping, it's underthrown, and Trevon Grimes now has to turn into a defensive back to prevent an interception there. So good play by Grimes to make sure that LSU can't get uh, a third interception of Kyle Trask on this game. But uh, on third down, the play call was fine. Grimes did get behind the defense, but a just really poor decision by Kyle Trask to not set his feet and just fling it um, results in another punt. So I can't really complain about the play calls too much. Maybe one or two, you might choose to do something else, but Florida didn't get conservative. They called good plays for what the defense was offering, and it was just execution problem after execution problem after execution problem that resulted in three straight punts. Florida did finally break that streak of three and outs and move the ball down the field, and they got to uh, the red zone again. And this was the problem area for the Gators, and this was their last real good chance to get a touchdown. So this is uh, fourth quarter, 427 to go, first down and goal. And here, LSU, on three straight plays, is going to do stunts with their two interior linemen. And now, I, as I said before, um, LSU used stunts that really were effective against uh, Florida's offensive line. We're going to see it again here. We've got guys crossing up. And here comes both of them. 99 split the difference. 92 is coming from the other side. And Kyle Trask just has to throw it away. And this ends up being called... Uh, intentional grounding. I'm not sure why the pass went this way, very high, but you've got one, two gators in the area. I guess he threw it too high. So they end up flagging that as intentional grounding and they lose uh, yardage instead of uh, going back to the original line of scrimmage. So now it's second and goal from further backed up and Florida is going to go with uh, a run play here because again, five in the box and you've got seven gators. Um, so th those are rushing numbers, and you like to run the ball in the, in the red zone. Florida tried to do it all night. Uh, but again, we get a stunt coming this way, guy coming around, and Rigid Garage also gets bull rushed back into the backfield. So you've got two Tigers right on top of Malik Davis, even though these were favorable numbers for rushing. So not great by the offensive line on these first two plays. Davis is able to spin out. Uh, he ends up cutting up back towards the middle, I might have liked him to try to continue to the edge, but whatever, he does get some positive yardage here. Um, so again, they ran against favorable numbers. They were able to get some positive yardage, get a little bit closer, um, but not great execution by the offensive line. Now here on third down, LSU is going to once again do a stunt with the interior lineman, and this time the guys in the middle are actually able to hold it up. So You'll see here, Reese is passing off this guy, and he's going to step over to get the other rusher. So we actually finally stop the stunt in the middle, but the problem is both tackles get beat around the edge. Both Stone Forsyth and Richard Garage get beat around the, the ends, and Kyle Trask is just kind of having to scramble and gets a little positive yardage for Evan McPherson. Now, Trask is uh, looking this way. There's nobody open over there because LSU is dropping seven. The Best play here probably would have been trying to get it to Grimes over here. He might have been able to get around the end, but Trask has no ability to try to make this throw right here because he's just trying to stay upright. So again, red zone problems, and this time it was pretty much all about the offensive line. They just could not handle what LSU's four defensive linemen were doing. And if you're trying to defend a team that wants to pass, uh, even on that rushing play, uh, that twist in the middle was able to blow up run play pretty quickly and then the two pass plays again blown up by poor offensive line play so that about does it um i don't think there was really too big of a problem with the strategy here florida did try to run the ball and were able to do it at times especially against favorable numbers uh perhaps they could have ran trask a little bit more i think that probably would have been good but you know ultimately it was a case of the strategy was sound for the most part and they just couldn't execute. They couldn't execute in the red zone. They couldn't execute uh, against those defensive line stunts. And it all comes back to the offensive line. Uh, the original lineup hasn't been that good this year. They tried a new lineup this time, and it wasn't 
very good, but for different reasons, usually. Um, the middle of that line wasn't terribly good. Uh, the tackles did hold up fairly well until the end there on that last play you saw. So I don't know what to, to say other than um, when Kyle Trask doesn't play at an otherworldly level, and he certainly didn't in this one, um, this year's Florida team just isn't good enough to win simply by showing up. Uh, LSU was down a ton of players, but they recruited well, and the guys who were left were still fairly talented, and they were able to hold serve against the Gators just enough so that when Florida made big mistake after big mistake after big mistake, uh, that was enough to cost the Gators the game. So that about does it for this one. Uh, Atlanta's coming up next. Maybe the Gators can figure out how to focus better and uh, execute better. And if they don't, it's going to be real ugly. So if you like this video, like and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.